This is the last week of this series, and on Sunday morning we will land um, our Stuck series. And so we've been talking about how do we make this, I mean, what do you have to do to make all this work for sure? And I said that this would be the four sticky words that you would have to remember. We started by looking at um, John the Baptist, uh, John the Baptist, uh, Peter, when Jesus came along and said, hey, you know, let, me, let me teach from your boat, pushed off the shore, and then Jesus looks at Peter after they've been fishing all night, and we kind of went into the details of the story, but basically, he just says, you know, let's go out and let's dodge your nets, and, and, and Peter doesn't want to go. We know that. We talked about that. We broke it all down, but there's four words that he says that makes all the difference, and this is the key to making sure that you're stuck. Peter looks back at him, and whether it was frustration, sheer obedience, whatever it was, he says, because you say so, and they did it. And the end result was about sunk the boat with the fish. And Jesus proved that he knew a lot more about fishing than Peter did. Those four words, because you said so, are the reason that you connect to the vine, or you connect to the vine and you become the branch you're supposed to be. It doesn't always feel good. You don't always feel like it. You don't always want to do it. You don't completely understand it. But you have to get to a moment in your walk with God where you get to the point where you say, but because you say so, I will do this. And in that moment, that is where faith meets every other barrier that you're ever going to find. That's the moment where your faith comes alive because you said so. When you understand enough about what Jesus has called you to do, what he wants you to do, and you're just done playing the games with him, you finally say, because you say so, I'll do it. Even though I don't get it. I don't understand it. I don't want to do it this way. There must be a better way. I don't think you got this one right. You can say all that, as long as you get to, but because you say so. Those four words will stick you to him, and Jesus rewards obedience. And so those are the words that become essential, and we've been talking about you know, how, are we, how do we keep from getting um, distracted? How do we get from being discouraged? How do we get beyond ourselves sometimes? And so where we've been, though, uh, in worship, and we've, we've covered a lot of stuff, um, Jesus doesn't want more from you. He wants more of you. We've talked about the word arrow, what an important word that is, about how, it, the, how it has to do with the branches that's lift up or cut off, but both are fair, um, and that's a part of understanding John 15. Um, we talked about not wanting not to be careful, but being competent. And there's a big difference between being careful and being competent. Um, being competent means that you've done something so many times right that you just can't get it wrong. It has nothing to do with being careful. You've just done the repetition, and you've just got it where you can do this now. You know you have to do this. Uh, we talked about the importance of connection, not production. It's not about what fruit you're going to bear. It's about being connected to Him. Um, this past Sunday, we talked about pruning. Pruning may it be painful, but it's not punishment. The way that we face pruning um, says a lot about who we are and how much we trust Him. I said, if you're not hungry, you become average, and there's no call in Scripture to be average. And so you have to start each day with a hunger, a desire to connect to Him in real and powerful ways. Um, God is more concerned with your eternal health than your temporary comfort. But we are all about our temporary comfort. We're all about what we want in the here and now. Uh, and we don't see the bigness of what happens in the here and now on the grand scheme of eternity. And that's where we have to come back and say, but because you say so, God, I'll do it this way. Uh, and that's what keeps us moving. And whatever you don't turn into praise will turn into pride. We talked about making sure that we understand that God really is the source of, of what He gives us, what He does and he does it very, very well. Now, all of that um, brought us to what we were talking about last week. And if you were with us last week, we started talking about the story of Hannah. Her husband's name was what? Elkanah. 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 And there's another sister wife involved here. What's her name? Uh, Panina. Panina. Yeah, Panina. And so, and if you remember the story, what's, what's the rub in the story? What's the problem in the story? Hannah's got no babies. Hannah's got no babies. And Panina, Panina can, Panina can drop those children. Boop, boop, she can drop kids. Yes. And for Hannah, this is a struggle. But Elkanah, being the man that he is, yes. he pulls her aside. And what was his basically, summarize his, his words of wisdom to her. 
baby, it's like, baby, you got me. Why do you need anybody else? I mean, you know, and, and, I, and I, think I, made the, I think I made the statement last week. You know, for a while he was doing really good, but how could you be so JV? I mean, he just didn't get it. Aren't I enough for you? And Scripture says that. What a great story in Scripture. Aren't I enough for you? You got me, honey. Come on, that's enough, you know. And I suggested all the men in the room try that when you get home, if, if that works with your wives, and, and you, know, you, you can write your own Old Testament book. Anyway, so we, so we get to the end of that, and we end up in 1 Samuel chapter 1, so go ahead and go there, verse 9. We left Hannah, she's discouraged. Elkanah has been no help to her. He hasn't helped pull her out of the doldrums. He has been insensitive. Um, the discouragement has mounted. Um, and so she feels alone. And I shared with you um, when I was told one time um, by a middle school girl that the loneliest she ever felt in her life when she, sat by, when she sat by herself at a table with all the other girls. And I said, you can be lonely in a crowd. And it is possible to be and feel that alone and that discouraged. And so... That's where we were last week, and so we go to 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 9. Somebody read that, and we will uh, pick up and just keep running until we run out of time. Uh, once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. The story picks back up. Hannah is still discouraged, but after a sacrificial meal there at the temple, she gets up and went to pray. The phrase, got up, okay, is important because the phrase, got up, communicates more than just posture. It's not telling us that she was sitting down and stood up. The word that is used there is a lot more tied into your emotional state. In other words, she got up. She was not going to take any more. She had had enough of feeling the way that she felt. In other words, this is a word uh, in the Hebrew that, that, that connotates not just getting up physically and moving, but it is a movement from inside. It is a movement forward in the spirit. It's a movement to do something beyond what you currently do. It's that moment where you know you, you sat and you've watched things and, you, and you're just compelled, I got to do something. I just got to do something different. And that's where she is. She's discouraged. We know that. We established that last week. So she gets up and she moves. Um, every one of us have gotten to a point where we've tried to fix things our way. We've tried to do it ourselves. We've tried to take care of it ourselves. Um, we've ignored it, uh, the problem. We've diminished it. We've dismissed it. Um, we've wallowed in it. But at some point, you do get to the point where you have to decide, I got to do something about this. And this is where Hannah was. Um, she tried all the excuses. She had tried all of the, heard all the good advice. She had dealt with all the abuse and the grief. Uh, and nothing was going to change. And so what she did is she got up. And we found in verse 10, it says, she stood up. And she was in deep anguish as she stood up. We just heard that. And she prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. The double use of the word, bakiah, in this verse indicates that it was more than just the presence of tears. It describes a loud weeping or even a wailing. So again, the words matter, and sometimes we lose them in our translation. So she gets up, and she is so upset, she is now just wailing. She is crying out to God. And if you were to read on and read ahead, between 1 Samuel 1 and 1 Samuel 18, there are six different Hebrew words that are used to describe um, how she's feeling. Different words that we don't always get. The first word is, she's downhearted. She's in deep anguish. She's in misery. She's deeply troubled. She's in great anguish. She's in grief. Two different Hebrew words talk about anguish. Great anguish and deep anguish. And the point of that is simply to say this. The writer is running out of Hebrew words to describe how miserable this woman is. She's in great anguish. She's in deep anguish. She's in the deepest of the deep anguish. In other words, I mean, he, as a writer, trying to capture how low she is. I mean, she has bottomed out. Okay? And that's the emphasis of the passage here. 
This lets you know exactly where Hannah's at. In your life sometimes, um, on the wheel of emotions, <laughs> um, we talk about a lot of different words, but discouragement is huge. And sometimes you're so discouraged you just can't put it into words. And so the writer is desperately looking for some sort of word that will describe and capture the essence of how she is feeling. Um, and out of her desperation, she cries out to God. Remember we said in, re- in week one, we talked about emotion. And I said that emotion will move you towards something else. Hannah's emotion has now moved her forward. She is doing something with this anguish that she feels. Um, and... Believe it or not, what's coming here, and you already know what the, 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 the takeaway is going to be here, her discouragement is going to drive her to connection. Go ahead and read her prayer in verse 11 out loud, somebody. And she made a vow saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant, uh, misery, and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. See, I like this verse. The last part especially, no razor will ever be used on his head. I think, I think there's a biblical thing here about haircuts that, that we could talk about, but we won't talk about it. Um, but basically, she says to God, you know, she goes, if you'll just give me this, what I'm asking God, I will give him back to you. And it sounds like she's negotiating with God. It does. And here's what I want you to know. As much as it sounds like, God, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you. Um, You can't negotiate with someone who holds all the chips. Okay? Yeah. I mean, mean, she's negotiating with God, or she's trying to negotiate with God, but you can't negotiate with God because he's got it all anyway. I mean, why why would God negotiate with you? You can't negotiate with someone who's got all the chips. Why would they give them up? You have nothing to offer. And that's an important thing to remember sometimes in our prayer life when we feel like we're negotiating with God. You're not, because you can't negotiate with God. What you're really trying to do is something else. And what's happening for Hannah is this is her way of communicating surrender. God, if you will just give me what I'm asking you, I will do everything and give him back to you. I'm going to surrender all that I am, all that this child will be. I will give him back to you. It is surrender. It's Hannah going back out into the water and casting her nets one more time. This is her moment for her. I've come to you, God, because you said I can come to you. Um, I'm going to surrender to your will. Read verses 12 through 15 of that passage. Someone out loud, keep reading. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, How long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Now, again, Hannah has a hard time with men. (laughs) I I, I I don't know if you're noticing this pattern that shows up, but you know, Elkin is trying to say, hey, hey baby, not, am I not enough for you? And then the priest looks at her and says, woman, are you drunk? I mean, I, I, what is wrong with you? I mean, and, and so Hannah has to explain again what's going on. Um, but the description is important. I was very discouraged, so I poured my heart out to God. And when your way isn't working, that's what you're supposed to do. When your way isn't cutting it anymore, that's the mandate that the Bible shows us. Take it to God and pour your heart out to God. And so that's what Hannah is doing. Hannah uh, says, don't think I'm wicked. Um, I've been praying out of great anguish. And Eli finally replies in verse 16 through 18, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant the request that you've asked of him. And Hannah responds with gratitude and went back and began to eat again. And she was no longer Sad. Notice what's happened. After Hannah cries out to God, she feels better. She's no longer discouraged. But let's take an honest inventory. Is she pregnant? No. Has she been promised a miracle? 
No. Eli has said, I hope God will request for you. May God grant you the request. But that's not a promise from God. So God hasn't spoken to her out loud and say, okay, I will, I will give you what you asked for. Does God speak to her in an audible voice and tell her she's going to conceive a child? No. Does God tell her she's finally going to get her way? No. And yet, she's no longer discouraged. So, her discouraging circumstances haven't changed. So what changed? Her connection with God. She finally went to the source where she could find comfort and hope and life and, and future beyond what she was trying to find in life with Elkanah, uh, uh, advice from the priest, uh, her community or lack of community around her. She finally went to the source where she could find the help. Discouragement melts away when she's connected to God. And that's the only thing that's happened here. That's all that happens in the passage. She's bottomed out. She cries out to God. She takes her life and connects it back to God. And the discouragement passes. None of the other situations have, have, have gone away. She's still going to be ridiculed in the community. Penina's still going to make fun of her. Elkin is still not going to understand his wife. Eli has said... Go in peace. And basically, I, I, you know, I read this passage, it says, go in peace, may the God of Israel grant whatever you ask him. I, I get a sense that Eli's trying to get her out of the room. <laughs> now, I got news for you. I, you know, I, I've had people I've had to try to get out of church before. You know? Nobody here. I mean, no, nobody here. But I mean, you know, okay, let me see if I can help you, all, help you along and get you, get you moving down the road here a little bit. I mean, you know, you, I, that's what's happening here. Don't, 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 don't put Eli up on a pedestal on this one. He's, he's just cleaning the house. He probably wants to turn out the lights and go home. I mean, where do we find him? He's sitting by the door. He's already sitting by the door waiting for everybody to go home. When I was a kid, there was a church custodian. Mr. Sewell was his name, Bill Sewell. And, you know, we had always taught that church was to be a caring place and a place of connection. So you know, we, we, at that time, back in those days, we still did church on Sunday night. Church in, in, at 8 o'clock on a Sunday night. People stand around talking to this, and 801, he's flashing the lights. <laughs> Last call, got to go home, got to go home, got to go home. I mean, he was running everybody out of the church. Finally, I remember, I remember that Ken Smith and I told him one time, I'll get the lights, you just go home. Uh, yeah, because again, I mean, people are like, we want to stick around a little while, but he, he got to get out of here, got to get out. He lights by the door, he's ready to go home. I, I don't know that for sure. That's my own application of what's happening here, but I think... That's what's going on. And so we're told that Hannah then, if the story goes on, and the rest of her family go home. And after time passed, Hannah conceived, and she had a son. She named him Samuel. Samuel sounds like the Hebrew word, heard by God. That's where Samuel comes from. That's where the name comes from. And so every time she heard his name, she was reminded that in her discouragement, God had heard her. Uh, discouragement is a loss of hope. Every time Hannah called her son, she was reminded of hope. He was a blessing. He was an answer to prayer. And so discouragement does one of two things. It will either drive you away from God or it will drive you to God. Hannah's success, the birth of her son, is because her discouragement drove her to God. That is not the way it happens in churches, by the way. That's not what followers of God generally do. Followers of God get discouraged and they go on a drift. I, I, I had a conversation with somebody this week. Nope, I don't want to tell you about that conversation. I'm going to tell you another conversation. Um, got an email from somebody this week who watched us online, and we are the first worship service they've watched and been a part of in the last 10 years because they got mad at the church and they got discouraged. They left. They left. And so they've been on a drift from God. Again, I, I, not making it, I'm, again, don't read anything beyond that. I mean, uh, the, you know, should they, shouldn't they, were they right, were they wrong? None of that matters. At the end of the day, it just illustrates the point. What happens when we get discouraged is we just disappear. 
because it's easier not to be connected or close to the things associated with God. And the easiest target of that is the church. So people get ticked at church or God and they go on a drift from the church because we don't say out loud we're mad at God because we know that God holds all the chips. I'm never going to be mad at God because he's having me with a lightning bolt. That's <laughs> dumb to tick God off. So I just, I just, I'll just tick off the puny church people. And we decide we're going to teach them a lesson. And we disappear. And when we disappear, then what happens is we've developed bad habits, bad patterns. It's just easier to stay at home. Because you can always just watch on TV or watch online. We're seeing having a pandemic, by the way. Is it gave people an excuse to start watching at home and then stay at home when the doors open back up. And so there's a health that's involved. We talked about that. We're going to talk about it Sunday morning, about how important it is in the way that the vines really work and how they connect. And it's important when you understand what a vineyard is and how a vineyard works. That illustration that Jesus tells or the illustration he uses is loaded with a lot of meaning about the church and what the church is supposed to be. And so what happens is when we get discouraged, our anxiety level comes up, um, we, we, we let it manifest itself in different ways. Um, when our anxiety level gets high, we realize how powerless we are to do something. You ever been in a situation where you just felt powerless and it mobilized? And so now on top of the discouragement, there's nothing you can do. Hannah went through that. I mean, she couldn't do anything. And it finally drove her to God. Um, we live in a world right now, if you haven't noticed, the culture around us, I mean, it, it, people worry. Um, and here's... Let me give you anxiety in a nutshell. Anxiety alerts us to the reality that, that what happens is we become very much aware of our own vulnerability and our lack of power. I mean, I, I, because we just can't do anything about it. it. It gets out of control. Anxiety just ramps up. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, but one of the things that does help the anxiety levels is that connection and the steadiness of being connected to God. Case in point, you've heard about it before. You know the guy's name. His name is Moses. If you look at the life of Moses, in Exodus 3.11, we read, Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israels out of Egypt? This is not false modesty. This is not Moses being a humble man, because Moses is not a humble man. When God says, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh, Moses says, who am I to do that? Let me tell you why Moses, this is anxiety. Moses, first thing, is that he'd already tried and failed. See, Moses is already living in the far side of the wilderness when God calls him because Moses is a man on the run. Moses has already tried to help his people. And he lost his cool. And he killed somebody. And they got ratted out. And so he ran. Um... He had killed the Egyptian. He buried the body in the sand. And Mo Moses was forced to leave behind the life that he knew. He was a guy on the run. He was moved to help his people and all of a sudden didn't know how to help them and blew it. And the situation was out of, out of control and he was afraid. He'd already tried. He had failed. Second thing that caused the anxiety is he was worried about what people would think. Um, the chapter, if you were to go back and read all of that chapter... Um, he asked God a lot of questions. But he's asking God questions that basically in essence were, what if the Israelites want to know the name of the one who appointed me to confront Pharaoh and bring the people out of Egypt? Later on, Moses asked, what if they don't believe me? Or listen to what I say. What if they don't believe me when I say the Lord uh, said this to me and they'll say the Lord didn't appear to you? What do I do then? Um, if we're honest, most of us would admit that... Um, most of our decisions are made on, based on what other people might think. At least for Moses, that was. Well, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't think it's you? What if they don't believe that I heard from you? What if they don't 
recognize you and they realize who I am? What if uh, someone rats me out again and all of a sudden Pharaoh decides he's going to kill me because I murdered a guy? What, what, what? I mean, we're always worried about the perception of others. And so for Moses, that too raised his anxiety level because he didn't want to deal with the fallout of people because the anxiety makes us so focused. Anxiety forces us to look and we discover that you know we can't we can't we can't do anything. We feel helpless. We're worried about all of the stuff that's going on around us, and the anxiety level begins to rise because we don't have answers to the what if questions. And Moses wants all of the answers. And then we, by the time you get to Exodus four ten, he also realizes he doesn't have what it takes. He says, you know, um, I get tongue tied. My words, they they get all tangled. Um, and he's letting, and I, I always get tickled when I read this part of Moses' story because it's like he's letting God in on some new information <laughs> that God doesn't know about it. Like, hmm. God's like, oh, I didn't know you couldn't talk very well, Moses. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that God just went, well, call the fire power, put out the burning bush. <laughs> got to do something different. I got to come up with another guy. You're not the man. I didn't realize you had a speech impediment. I guess I've called the wrong guy. But that's not God. That's not the way God works. That's not how he does things. Uh, Instead, he reminds Moses of what is important um, in the big picture and the connection that he has with God. This is what he says in verse 11 and 12. Um, And these are some of the most overlooked and yet most powerful verses in all the Scripture. Then the Lord... Ask Moses, who makes a person's mouth? <laughs> How many times read that passage and never realized that God asked Moses that question? Who, who makes your mouth, boy? That's a southern paraphrase. Who decides whether people speak or do not speak? Who decides whether people hear or do not hear or see or do not see? Is it not I, the Lord? I'll go. I will be with you as you speak, and I will instruct you what to say. Every excuse just melts away. Because in that moment, God connects him back to, whoa, 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 I'm the source here, dude, not you. All that stuff you're anxious about, I, I, I got that. I can take care of that. I'm bigger than that. Um, and then... The other thing that Moses was struggling with, and there's no doubt about it, uh, he understood that the task was dangerous and overwhelming. Uh, a few years ago, uh, and, and I found this fascinating, Amazon released an interesting piece of trivia. I was not aware of this. When people order an ebook, apparently Amazon has the ability to track which portions of the book you highlight. Really? So you own the book, wow. but Amazon knows what you're highlighting in your book. Now, I'm not going to say who you can talk to about that in this room. <laughs> John Barber. But neither here nor there. Um, but so, so when you have that ebook that you, that you bought from Amazon, you think you're highlighting and no one knows that you're highlighting? Yeah, yeah. They know. Anyway. It will also tell you how many other people highlighted that. Well, yes, they can. Um, so here's, here's, but here's the point of illustration, not that they can do that, because if you didn't know that, well, you should have known that, because come on. Uh, but anyway, after accumulating seven years of data, Amazon revealed the most highlight passage in all of the e-books that have been sold over that seven-year period. Now, that's wildly intriguing to me. You might be surprised to find out it comes from a book called Key to the Kingdom. <laughs> no, it really does. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. That was second. But the first highlighted passage is a line from the second Hunger Games book. Mm-hmm. Now, the Hunger Games, mm-hmm. young adult reading, yeah. even though it's really not. I mean, it's, it's, it's a major novel, but it's, it, young adult reading. Um, and here is the one sentence in all the books over seven years that's highlighted more than any others. It says, and I quote, sometimes things happen to people and they're not equipped to deal with them. Most highlighted wow. sentence in every ebook that Amazon has sold over a seven year period. Can you imagine people reading the book and choosing to highlight the passage? 15 year old girl reads and 
she's reading the book, but constantly checks her Instagram to see if her latest post has gained any more likes while she listens to her parents yelling in the other room. Sometimes it happen to people, and they're not equipped to deal with them. A man is trying to pass time in an addiction recovery center. He picks up the book trying to connect with his daughter who hasn't talked to him in weeks, and he comes to that line. Sometimes things happen to people, and they're not equipped to deal with them. A cancer patient reads as they're waiting for the next treatment. It could be anybody, but eventually uh, everyone ex experiences reality that sometimes things happen in our life that we're not equipped to deal with. Things come along, and they're just bigger than we are. And there's times where you've got to come to grips with the fact that life is not going to be what you pictured it to be. It's not going to work that way. And the older you get, what we want to be safe and predictable, we discover it isn't safe and predictable at all. See, for Moses, Moses had 40 years where he's living risk-free in the desert. I mean, his biggest risk was a wild sheep. Sheep squad. Sheep squad. Yes. Um, for the past 40 years, he'd been a recluse. Uh, and he didn't have to worry uh, about anything. Uh, but sometimes things happen to people. And they're not equipped to deal with them. Now, most of you never would have guessed that that is the most highlighted sentence in e-books sold on Amazon. But it begs the question, why does that sentence resonate with so many people when they read it and go, wow, that's a, that's a sentence. I guarantee you the writer didn't know it when he wrote it. Had no idea. Had no idea. He wasn't targeting to become an all-time highlight winner. He wasn't, he wasn't targeting that. It was just fitting into the story. Um, because the reality is, sometimes things happen to people, and we're not equipped to deal with them. Um, and now, all of a sudden, here comes God interrupting Moses' 40-year living in the wilderness, growing out his hair, watching the sheep, playing sheep games, whatever he's doing. And now he's being asked by God to go stand before the most powerful man in all of the world. Perhaps, at this point in history, the most powerful man in all of human history, at this point. And tell him, look. Let my people go. If you're Moses, you are not equipped for this. Doesn't happen. Exodus 4.13, Moses pleads with God, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. And if you go back and you take a deep dive into all of that, God responds to all of those anxious objections of Moses, not by highlighting Moses' competency, but emphasizing the connection that God has to Moses. He keeps saying to Moses, I will be with you. God does not affirm at any point in the story, and we got to wrap this up. See, when we talk about discouragement and anxiety, God does not affirm that at any point in the story. Hear what I'm saying to you. God does not affirm or recognize those excuses and that argument. Does God know? Yes, God knows you're anxious. Does God know you're discouraged? Yes. But God does not affirm that by saying, it's okay, don't worry about it. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, you just go ahead and be discouraged and be anxious for a little while. You wallow in that. He never says that. God responds to Moses over and over again by simply reminding Moses of the connection that he has to him. I will be with you. I know you're anxious. I'll be with you. I know you're discouraged. I'll be with you. I'm asking you to do something. And Moses' answer has to get to the point because you said so, because Moses doesn't want to do this. Everything in Moses is saying this is a bad idea. This is a bad plan. It's not going to work. And it doesn't. On paper, it does not work. And there are a lot of moments in the whole encounter thing. Remember the ten plagues? It wasn't working real well, it didn't seem like. And even when Moses got everybody out, it didn't seem to go real well immediately. Because then he ended up with his back against the water. And an army chasing him. 
And then when he got him a quash of water, he found out that God had gave him the biggest bunch of whiners ever born in the history of humanity. And these whiners were going to cost him the opportunity to go into the promised land. And how did God respond to all of that? Not by giving him Moses a pass on anything that he was offering by way of excuse, why I can't, it's just too hard, I can't do it. I'll be with you. I'll be with you. And so God reaches into our world and he says to us, you stick your life to me. You connect to me. I will be with you. This connection is what's going to make all the difference. When we say, I can't, I'll be with you. I'm not feeling it. I know. I'll be with you. But I'm anxious. I'll be with you. And you say, why, God? Why should I do it? Because I'll be with you. And you have to get to the Simon Peter moment of simply saying, because you said so, I'll do it. And in that moment, then and only then, will you be connected to the vine in such a way that you will grow and produce the fruit that you were created to produce. Because he says so. And every hero in the Bible had the same struggle we do. Every hero in the Bible had the same objections that we do. Every hero in the Bible had the same circumstances, and usually worse. But yet when they got to the point of saying, okay, because you said so, and they become obedient, that's when God does his greatest work. It's cool. It's fun. It's amazing. That's why Jesus said what he said the night before he died. But it's also one of the harder things that we have to put in play in our life. Let's pray. We'll be done. God, we thank you that you are a God who helps us deal with the feeling. And as we're dealing with the feeling, we have to come to grips with the fact that um, because your ways are not our ways and your thoughts are not our thoughts, is there's just some times in our life that we, we're, we're going to push back, we're going to offer excuses, and it's not going to go well. But we have to finally get to the point where we let go and let you. Lord, help us to be willing to be stuck to you and remind us of those words, because you said so. And help us not to forget them to say them often. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.